In the early American 20th century saw the rise of a movement that stood apart from others at the time, and brought with it an optimism for peaceful improvement which was absent among other radical ideologies. This ideology was known as technocracy. The fundamental core of technocracy as could be derived from its name, techno meaning skill, ocracy meaning rule or government, is the rule of a national unit known as a technet by the most skilled and educated of society in place of elected politicians. Specifically the ideology sought to epitomize the rule of scientists and engineers to run the various functions of a technet as though it were a mechanical body. Technets were in essence super states as core to the ideology was the elimination of roles for politicians and racketeers, people who the technocrats believed could be easily corrupted or bought by special interest groups. This was to be achieved by simplifying communication, production, and distribution to be handled by a special elite. What that amounts to is a necessity for self-sufficiency. Every technet was meant to be self-sustaining and capable of removing itself from the international scene. This was likely inspired by the fact the US had to that point remained a highly isolationist nation. However, on the matter, the US alone would not suffice to form a self-sufficient unit, and the proposition was for the North American technet to expand from Greenland to Panama. This would maximize industry, agriculture, resource availability, and domestic shipping to theoretically provide for all those within the technet. The North American technet was also just one of several the technocracy movement considered had the ideology ever reached beyond the US. A greater East Asian technet, a Indo-Persian technet, a European technet, South African technet, and South American technet were all considered ideal in their balance of population, industrialization, infrastructure, and resources to form self-sustaining units. The heart of each techno was to be what is known as a megalopolis, a vast stretch of metropolitan urban land, where in a technocracy, intellectuals and workers could congregate, produce power for the rest of the techno, and operate all the necessary life functions of the national machine. For North America, this was to be the Northeast Megalopolis, a region encompassing New York City, Washington DC, Boston, as well as entire states, and large Eastern Canadian cities. Megalopolises exist in other would-be technets, and are usually found along continuous stretches of major cities and population centers. The technocrats also proposed a four-hour workday and four-day work week, which they believed in absence of useless and inefficient work practices could create a system in which all businesses and services remain open non-stop 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Payment in the theoretical technet was to come in the form of a certificate of distribution, with which you'd be allowed to withdraw or receive a certain quantity of rations based upon the current level of production across the technet. If there's a surplus, you can take out more. If there's a deficit, you get less until production of that product goes back to sustainable levels. By now, you probably get the sense this ideology is very socialistic, and that would be right. It's important to remember that this movement saw its rise during the era of the Great Depression. Things were pretty bad financially, people were losing faith in the government, and much like Huey Long with his socialistic policies, the technocracy movement feared the rise of communism in what would surely be a bloody and culturally devastating revolution. The technocrats thus hoped to offer a more peaceful and official political solution. A major distinction between communism and technocracy is their stance on class. Whereas communism aimed to eliminate class differences, the technocrats recognize that in this world there are leaders and there are followers. There will always be a ruling class and there will always be a class below that. Leaders must lead, followers must follow, and ideally the most intelligent of society should be the leaders. Everyone else is but a worker drone who just needs to punch in, punch out, then enjoy his free time. If that sounds good to you, you might just be a worker drone. No shame in it. Basically, every communist society ends up realizing this too late. You could thus joke that the technocrats wanted to just skip the step that could accidentally make someone a dictator, and just said, hey workers, we're going to give you the means of production, but you have to listen to us when we tell you how to use it. And I'd say that overall sums them up pretty well. However, much like Huey Long's untimely assassination, the ambitions of the technocracy movement were cut short. The chief pull of the movement was that it attracted the disillusioned average citizen, who just wanted the depression to end without terrible bloodshed, and eventually, it did. See, the technocrats were adamant that the US would not recover from the depression for decades, and it would only be a matter of time until their exponentially growing following propelled them to the seat of power. But then, World War II broke out, the economy began to recover, industries came back to life, jobs opened up, and the technocrats as a major movement were no more, falling into a deep obscurity that lasts even until this day. But what if that changed? What if for some reason or another the US never did recover from the depression, or perhaps under Roosevelt's New Deal policies, sunk far deeper to the point that conditions in the nation were no longer tolerable by even the wealthy? Hypothetically, we could see a world where FDR might impose overwhelming taxes upon businesses to redistribute wealth back to the common citizen. This initially alleviates some burden from the lower classes, but eventually it's too stressful for the businesses, and many close up, some move overseas, and some begin to back the only alternative they see. 
Businesses like Ford Motors and Hughes Aviation could easily find themselves shoulder to shoulder with the engineers and intellectual elites of the technocrats, funding them in a major campaign to take both Congress and the presidency. The mid-1930s were also an ideal time to wrangle in America's neighbors, Mexico and Canada. Mexico in 1934 would have handed presidency down to Lazarno Cardenas, a man who would fit quite squarely with the technocrats, having in his presidency nationalized major resource industries and promoted a more widespread education system to create a generation of skilled laborers. Mexico at the time believed it was on the verge of stabilizing itself after a near continuous history of revolution, which could either help or hinder the technocrats in negotiating a deal. We'll suppose that Cardenas, seeing American support as a means to assure Mexican stability, establishes with the technocrats an identical, though independent system in Mexico to be gradually integrated with that of the U.S. if it succeeds. Canada had perhaps seen a more intense depression than the U.S. and endured even more devastating crop destruction than its southern neighbor. The conservatives were quickly losing favor while an organization of labor unions and communists began taking on greater size. We're of course taking some liberties in this scenario to give the technocrats all they hope to achieve before the war breaks out. But if we overall want to generalize a major point of divergence for this world, we could simplify it as conditions in the depression being much worse and the popularity of the technocrats just being more widespread. We could imagine in this world with the technocrats having been more prominent, that those within Canadian labor unions would come to favor them over the communists and launch a similar movement from within the Canadian labor party. As in Mexico, negotiating with the US to implement identical policies while gradually integrating national systems. Overall doing so for the purpose of alleviating the strains of the depression and ensuring stabilization. For the US, technocracy slowly but surely alleviates piece by piece the woes of the depression, and while at first things may not be luxurious, life does return to a level of comfort many had only dreamed of during the depression. The majority of the population is ecstatic to return to work in newly established industrial jobs, which would generate the building blocks for new connective infrastructure across the US, further bridging the gaps between it and its neighbors. All the while, southern tropical crops supplement the lost crops in the US and Canada. Things overall become more secure, but at a clear cost to some lesser freedoms. Job specialization assures citizens have a job to go to, but limits them to a number of government-selected choices, based on their skills. Work hours, though few they may be, would be mandated and strict. Missing work would likely result in a temporary suspension of not only your food, but also your water, electricity, heat, and any other utility which would now be provided by the government. A government which can assure security only so long as every piece of the machine is doing its job. Central America and the Caribbean in most part were under a combination of Mexican-American influence, with the exception of some British colonial possessions. This allows for seamless government transitions in the region akin to that which was seen during the Banana Wars, which brings these regions closer under the reins of the technocrats. It wouldn't be until the outbreak of World War II with the German occupation of Denmark that Greenland, who just is in our world, saw occupation by the US, would be brought into the sphere of influence of the technocrats, who by this point have unofficially merged the governments of all nations involved into a joint planning council for maximum efficiency. The technocratic government of Canada opts out of involving itself in the war for the sake of preserving technocratic isolationism, however this does not stop several from voluntarily enlisting to support the British against Germany. For the majority of its existence, the new technocratic order would stress isolation for the North American powers and focus efforts on domestic production and development, acclimating population via means of worker exchange programs across the Technet regions, promotion of multilingual classes, freedom of mobility to scenic destinations across the Technet, and introduction of exotic produce from all across the continent. The technocrats, however, would need to deal with anti-integration groups, as well as anti-socialist groups, which rightly didn't stand for the drastic changes being made not only in the US, but also in Canada and Mexico. Possibly forming the basis for an anti-industrial ladistic group, seeking to upset and sabotage the technet systems, it'd be very possible for Germany and the Axis to support these anti-establishment groups, which in turn would inspire anti-Axis sentiment among the technocrats. A sentiment which would escalate to a level of rage once Japan launched its attack against Pearl Harbor, motivated by America's seeming adoption of socialism and a refusal to conduct business with Japan on grounds of neutrality. The Technet is forced to declare war against Japan in retaliation for this aggression, inadvertently pulling it into a war with Germany as well. Thus, World War II kicks off with not only an American industry placed into high gear, but with multiple times the output of our world thanks to the expansive industrializing of the technocrats. Germany is still defeated and post-war reconstruction begins. Here is once again where things take a drastic change. The less dramatic fear of communism paired with the continued ambitions of self-sufficient isolation would lead the American technic to withdraw from the Pacific, surrendering occupancy of Japan and Korea to the USSR. In Europe, food becomes scarce as roads and infrastructure lay in rubble. Disease runs rampant and poverty climbs to levels unseen since the market crash. 
The technocrats can't help but sympathize and feel the need to act, recognizing the solutions lay squarely in the hands of the Europeans, but political bureaucracy stands in the way. Thus, in an effort to help the Europeans help themselves, aid is lent, but not alone. With it comes the promotion of technocratic philosophy, especially reaching out to those whom Britain too feared may begin supporting the communists, propagandizing to workers and unions, educating the population in the ways of technocracy, paving the road for the European coal and steel community, in our world the foundations of the European Union, in this world the beginnings of the European technet. Our world saw German industry suppressed post-war out of fear that the Germans would once again rise up and outcompete the rest of Europe. This world sees a think tank of German, British, French, Belgium, Italian, and Dutch scientists, economists, and engineers take German industry and put it to work for the whole of Europe. Britain, just as in our world, is hesitant to wholly join this community, but the intellectual elite of the nation turned to it as perhaps the sole solution to European recovery and security from the USSR, save from the total support of America, which in this world can't be relied upon. The British Labour Party and even leader of the British Union of Fascists, Oswald Mosley, would champion the philosophy and push to integrate it into the national policy. What we're left with is a world in which the status of superpower comes and goes for the American technet. It recognizes the grandeur of the title yet continues to isolate itself as had always been intended. Though the technocrats disliked communism, they weren't so much concerned for its spread so long as it stayed out of North America. They knew that so long as their own territory remained stable, all they could possibly need was readily accessible without the hassle of international affairs and dependencies. Europe begins to go much the same route as the US, however adopts a much less free character. The freedoms ingrained in the cultures of the North American colonies so long ago were never fully embraced despite revolutions and reforms. Much like the modern EU of today, there'd be little tolerance for so-called dangerous and dissident speech. And with so much power now vested in the hands of a superior elite, it is very possible the technet of Europe would become an unsettling reflection of George Orwell's 1984. The Soviets, despite recognizing the new American and European orders as socialistic, would still perceive both as threats, just as it had with Yugoslavia and later China, who refused to bend to their whim. Negotiations would of course be made for the sustaining of peace, but all sides would prepare to defend themselves by any means necessary. The technocrats in the US, now having the sandbox that was atomic power to play with, would begin experimenting heavily with its applications, not only for civilian use, but also in weaponry. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.